What is the impulse that moves young people to learn to play a musical instrument or to create their own music? What inspires them to write poetry or to write a short story? What drives them to participate in sports and to push themselves to their limits and beyond? More important, how can teachers harness their students' natural creative energy to help them reach their full potential? So how to motivate kids, that's, that's at the center of it because if a child is um, a, participant, a participant in his own process or her own process, if she feels or he feels um, that there's something here that belongs to them, that they can take ownership of and acknowledge, um, then we have a chance to, um, to build something from that. You're exaggerating that a little bit right here. This looks like a turnip growing on her face instead of a... It's, it's more yeah. like a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, also move back. You're, you're trying to lay the light down. Move the dark in while you're doing the light. Work them both at the same time. So if I could somehow create a vehicle, an environment, where kids could get in touch with their own creativity, where they could get in touch with their own self, um, and discover the exceptional self that is there and mm -hmm. every child is a gifted child. I believe that after 25 years of teaching it's not something I just believe, it's something I know. That edge wasn't decided ahead of time. That edge is the result of your moving back and forth and letting one thing define itself against another and that's it. See you're stopping here. Let those things move in, move back, back and forth, back and forth. Figure ground, figure ground, note against note, color against color. For me, it's more of a, a personal commitment to love the work that I do, to really love and enjoy teaching, to really take a, a caring time to talk to as many of the students as you can to get to know them on a personal level so that you can pick the things that you know motivate them. It may be something very small that maybe other people don't even, you know, if you don't bother to ask and find out more about them, you're not going to know. So you have to be this personal commitment to say, I love my work. And I say that to myself every day. You know, I really love what I'm doing. I really love these kids. These are wonderful tones of color. So all of that mixing, all of that, you know, this is like I'm frustrated. I don't know what to do, but look how much sense you're making out of it. You're doing all the right things in terms of coming back and trying to make clear what is muddled. So you're coming back and you're, you're re-establishing. I think success motivates too. So first of all, I develop vehicles so that the process teaches a child how to get in touch with what's interesting to him or her. And then give them permission and opportunity to ask their own questions and come up with their own answers. And, and during the celebration, critique, um, talk to us about what their process was, how they found what they found. What do you think? So what am I separating? Well, this is coming forward, that's moving back, and this is another plane that's going to the side. So if I want to show that those three things are doing three different things, I'm going to give it three different tones. We're getting successful result. The products are working, not because we're trying to make a product, but because the product is a natural uh, result of learning processes. But it's playing music for me uh, with the class and saying this music is the most beautiful music in the world and convincing them that you have to perform it in such a way that it is going to be the most beautiful music when the people hear it. It's not just a small group of talented students that we're accessing. We're accessing the creative center. Every net has some holes in it and a good teacher creates different nets so that the child that can't achieve in one modality or one type of format can achieve in another one. Can you imagine studying the literature of man, the history of man, and then singing your way through it, dancing your way through it, making music your way through it, writing your way through it, and imaging your way through it? You see, that's my dream as a teacher, to, to build a program in combination with other teachers where we could take the greatest literature and the history of man and communicate about it through all of those languages and we would we would help children become multilingual not just in the languages that we speak to each other mm -hmm. but in our visual sound and movement languages as well 
There's no substitute for a good teacher in a classroom. And policy is not a substitute. And teacher-proof textbooks are not a substitute. And certainly, I mean, certainly dictated, prescribed ways of teaching that come from the State Department of Education or from politicians are the worst possible substitute because what they do is deprive teachers of their professional authority. Teachers have to be constantly learning and teachers have to be excited about coming to school every day. I've had, I'm sure you've had teachers, the teacher's bored, the students are going to be bored. So when a teacher sees it as something exciting and vital, then the students are much more likely to get engaged with that. You know, if they're not interested in what they're doing, then you're not going to be interested either. As long as students' creativity is not respected in the classroom, and his um, urge to explore and discuss things is not um, incorporated into academic planning, then we're going to have very angry students in classes. Teachers need to give a lot of respect to students' thinking mm -hmm. and their feelings. My teacher um, told me in the beginning of the school year that I uh, asked too many questions and she said, am I going to have to limit you to one question a day? Learning has to be an act um, that involves the engagement of the learner, that learners have to, have to as it were, be the people who, who, who take control of their own learning by asking questions. If someone didn't ask questions a lot, I would start to worry about that child because it seems like they want to be paying attention and they don't want to learn anything or they know it all already. There's a lot of research that shows that um, little boys get more attention and a different kind of attention in the math classroom than, than girls do. Um, even by teachers who are well-meaning and think that they're giving equal attention, that when they're videotaped, uh, it shows that they don't. They give the boys, they ask the boys the questions first. Um, they spend more time with the boys, they ask them more probing questions. I think that for the large part, the teachers are pretty good, but I think that there's a decent size of prejudiced teachers mm -hmm. and ineptitude. We're all influenced by the racism in, this, in our society, and even though we don't want to act in, in prejudicial ways, we tend to, to act that way. Like some teachers are like, they all like Hispanics, and you talk Hispanics in the class, they don't let you. Oh really? No, uh, they don't. <laughs> And some teachers are like mean to us, you know, plus they don't teach us enough, you know. Some of the teachers can favor some other kids that are smarter, but if they're not smart, they figure that they're not going to get any smarter, so they don't <coughs> help them. Yeah, and like there are the kids that like don't try, but it's not always because that they don't want to try, because sometimes like the environment they come from can be like a bad environment, like say they're like it's they live in like a bad area. And so, and when they get like made fun of, if they do their homework and if they do good in school, 